I want you to clear up right now the virulence of COVID. What do we know about the ratios involved in this virus? What are we learning? Yeah, so this virus is, is truly um, interesting in the sense that it causes this broad spectrum of diseases. So it's very true that the vast majority of people will suffer what we call sort of mild to moderate diseases, uh, maybe even no symptoms at all. But when you look at um, the vulnerable portions of the population, <clears throat> the elderly, uh, when you look at people with secondary medical conditions, such as diabetes, heart disease, other lung disease, and to be honest, even when you look at relatively healthy individuals, um, there are a significant number of part of the population that has very severe disease requiring if not a hospital visit, um, in, in, um, admission into the hospital. So it runs in a, a, a huge spectrum in terms of how it presents um, after infection. I don't want to talk enzymes on a Friday, and I certainly don't want to talk RNA transcriptase and the other necessities <laughs> of doing a test. But I would suggest respectfully, doctor, that America from the top down doesn't understand the sophisticated chemistry and biochemistry of tests. How hard is it to do a test and millions of tests for this virus? So we know a lot about the virus and you certainly can do good testing. It requires not only a good test, but it also requires a good laboratory that's validated, that knows how to do testing, that knows how to do the controls, and knows how to um, show that they can reproducibly perform the test well. So that's where it's really important to be focused in on public health agencies and medical institutions that know how to do these tests. Professor Pekosh, talk to us about reinfection and immunity. Are people that have had the virus really getting infected twice? Yeah, so right now um, it's still a little bit um, unclear, but um, it, this, is, this gets back to the testing issue. Oftentimes what I've seen is people who are testing positive by the, you know, the test that tells you if you're infected, which is a PCR test that detects the virus. That doesn't necessarily mean you've been reinfected. It may simply mean that there are small amounts of the virus that are still in your system um, from the infection that you've already controlled a few days ago or a week or so ago. So right now there really is no good evidence to suggest that you're getting reinfected after your first exposure. It may simply be that the virus is hanging around and you see vestiges of the virus there um, after you're, you've controlled the initial infection. But it's something that's very important to, to understand as we think about rolling at, back and, and coming, uh, relieving some of our public health interventions. Yeah, do we have a credible test to test immunity? Again, it, it seems that we, we actually have more questions than answers on the virus right now, as you're saying. So testing positive is not the same thing as testing and being able to transmitting the virus to someone else. But when do we find Absolutely. out whether people have immunity and therefore can go back to work safely? Yeah, so it's going to be, there's going to be a two-part uh, phase to that. Um, many of the tests that are out there will tell you if you've had an infection and if you have antibodies. Um, now, that's important because that'll tell us how many people were infected the first time this virus moves through the population. But most of those tests don't really tell you if you're protected from reinfection. That's going to take a second set of tests that are done uh, more in laboratory settings that take a little bit of time to develop, but that'll differentiate people who just have some antibodies right. to it versus the people that have antibodies that we think will protect you from reinfection. We'd like to think that those are gonna be very closely related, but we have to do those experiments to be 100% sure that right. the rapid tests that people are establishing are really telling you that you're protected from infection or reinfection. Uh uh, doctor, I'm going to break a, a rule here. We usually don't talk type 1, type 2 constructs on Friday. We really try to save that for a Wednesday conversation. Tell, help me with reject the true or accept the false of this testing. How at risk is America to type 1 and type 2 malfunction in our testing? Yeah, so again, this gets back to, to, to the laboratories that are doing the testing and making sure that the tests are being performed in um, rigorous, 
controlled environments. Um, you can have two types of errors, right? You can have a false positive, meaning that you test positive when you really aren't infected. Um, and the other type of error is that you test negative when you really are infected. And it's that latter group that's really the most um, important to be um, aware of, because that really means that you're telling people who are infected that they can go back out in the population and behave, you know, uh, and, and not take extra precautions. And again, laboratories that know how to perform these tests do something called validation, right? So they go through and they test with known samples um, both types of error and report back mm -hmm. what exactly they expect those errors to be. Right. Um, other laboratories that are just sort of fly by night may not be reporting that rigorously, and yeah. that's where some of the danger yeah. comes in. What you just heard there, folks, is the single most important analysis I've seen on this national and, frankly, global uproar on testing. That's something really to move forward with in your reading this weekend, what Dr. Peshoff said there on type 1 and type 2 analysis and the need for adults to do the medicine.